Okay, and um, may I uh, ask, does everybody see the uh, PowerPoints? Yep. Yeah. Okay, so we're ready to go. Uh, this one uh, is actually, and I want to preface it by saying this, it's also used by my 22 graduate students in SE 5100 uh, this semester for the first time. And this is essentially your lecture 30 or the last lecture. Thank God you're done with me now. You don't have to listen to me anymore. It's the 2B YouTube. Um, so there was a 1A and 1B a YouTube on systems education, and there's a 2A and 2B YouTube. This is the last one. And I have to say that because of its subject matter, it may overlap a bit with your lecture 26, which was on two isomorphies, the origins isomorphy and the emergence isomorphy. I treated them together because they're linked um, in, you might say, phenomenologically linked, um, and there may be some um, repetition in here, but there's also a bunch of new slides, so I hope you go through this. Uh, of course, there'll be quiz questions on it uh, in the quizzes, the, the seventh quiz and the final also. Okay, enough to the SE 5100, to the rest of you, this is my theory of emergence, which derives from the continuous uh, or unbroken sequence, I call it, of the uh, integration diversification or the ID cycles I showed you last time. So we'll try to show that both natural and social systems or human systems originate by the same rules and patterns and so are unified and integrated by those processes. Now that's very interesting because systems engineers and so on think human systems are totally different from natural systems. And I remember arguing with uh, Russ Acoff when he was president and I was vice president of the society very vehemently for a long period of time that uh, uh, his statement was that uh, natural systems had nothing to say about human systems. And we're actually in opposition to that uh, in this and in many other aspects of the systems processes theory. So the last time we were together uh, in the last YouTube, uh, there was a broad survey of integration and diversification processes from the Big Bang all the way to current cultures, religion, and everything. I might say that Tyler Volk's brilliantly titled book was Quarks to Culture, and that grabs it in three words. However, he wasn't talking there about the origins of systems per se, and that's what we are. And so the unbroken sequence of uh, those systems uh, is systems origins across about 14 billion years. And I gave this talk uh, many, many times at IFSS, starting with my initiation, uh, my incoming presidential lecture up in Portland, and that was uh, approximately 1979. And the last one I gave was IFSS in a Silomar, IFSS annual conference in 2004. Although I've given it a bunch of other times, like I gave it also at the, when I was invited for two weeks to the University of Alaska at Anchorage, their complex systems department. And what we're gonna look at is empirical approaches to a general theory of emergence, not theoretical approaches, empirical approaches. And you can challenge me on that uh, at the end and see if I've accomplished that. So there are steps to a general theory of emergence, uh, just like there are steps to the uh, basic concept of the theory of evolution. And the reason for it is, is that it's really, the theory of evolution describes an algorithm of how new species occur. And when you stop and think of it, uh, it has steps like overpopulation because of the tendency for reproduction to overpopulate, uh, limited environment for those things which are reproduced. And so there's a imposed selection and uh, the selection leads to the selection of particular genotypes or gene assemblies, which then are adapted to the new environment. And as the environment changes, the species change. Uh, but we're here talking about a theory of emergence, which looks at how new scales of entities appear in the cosmos. 
And we call those appearance of a new type of object in the universe as emergence. We say big E emergence just to distinguish it from the little E emergences that many of the systems engineers and other people talk about. It usually results in a new log scale of size of object, which has um, actually also different qualities, but, and so it follows emergence in that sense, but it's the new log scale of size and the new um, binding constants that we think about. So it's not cell organization or autopoiesis. It's not a conventional origin of anything that originates on and within a scale. We'll argue for a continuous set, continuous set of such emergences. So what do we mean by the unbroken sequence of origins? You've already got that in the last lecture, so I'll just quickly go through this. The next level of object emerges from the last by natural spontaneous mechanisms, by their internal characteristics. So it's an unfolding of the potential in terms of statistical thermodynamics that a new scalar level occurs. But it always occurs across a scalar gap. It's not a causal gap or a discontinuity in that sense, but it is a gap in the characteristics of the past scalar level relative to the new one. So the significance of the entire sequence of emergence events is that it can explain how all of our universe of objects came to be without a break in between them. Now this is different from complex systems groups ideas of emergence or their sequences. For example, Kaufman's work, Morowitz's work, and his colleagues, uh, Tyler Volk's work, these are all related to specific uh, entities. And it's different from David Christian's because it explains uh, and tries to use empirical approaches and scientific approaches. So it's a, it's a creature of system science, not of history. It actually could lead to a new mythos, a new native story of origins. Uh, and uh, I say it uh, also speaks to modern natural wisdom. In other words, uh, I've created an entirely new philosophy called endronormism that comes from trying to follow the isomorphies uh, instead of uh, dogmas in the past. So the story developed from the empirical results of seven conventional sciences, astronomy, physics, chemistry, geology, biology, math, and computer science integrated by systems processes. And we were sponsored and paid for by the National, uh, National Science Foundation, Department of uh, Education, and several other groups to try to use reductionist data to explain such a transition in terms of the mechanics and therefore as a result of experiments providing evidence for them. It enables the use of tools, techniques, and referee data from these seven sciences to test our hypothesized process for emergence. But it's using them in a different way than the sciences usually use them because it goes beyond each science. And that's, uh, as we said last time, uh, verboten in the scientific method, uh, the conventional scientific method, which uh, is strictly reductionist. It results in this constrained empirical theory of emergence uh, that uh, helps prove emergence scalar levels. And uh, I guess I didn't finish two there, sorry. So in the beginning, when you try to do such a project, there's a need for calibration. You must reduce noise to perceive a signal. And that's preparation before the works begin. Um, and what I did when I was looking at the isomorphies back in the 70s, when I first started, that's a half a century ago. Uh, if I don't look old enough, then uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, but to many people, I'm sure I do. Um, I eliminated all words that didn't have to do with a process or a mechanism or an algorithm in order to model how systems work. And so I eliminated words like complexity, which is a result of systems origins, not a causative agent, uh, I think. And there's a bunch of other words like that, many, many words in the system science lexicon that actually turn people off because they're kind of, uh, what do you call it, jargon for that priesthood. And then there was a uh, need to establish rigorous criteria to identify the levels. 
and, and that would avoid the cacophony of meanings and philosophical musings. So we were going to use data and data to show not just the levels, but the neglected gaps. If there are gaps between the levels as a definition of hierarchical scalar levels, then there should be data for the gaps to show the gaps. And that was completely neglected at the time when I started this. Um, also to identify the alternation of continuities and discontinuities in the whole sequence, the unbroken sequence. So the evidence that I accumulated was against some of the most accepted level, like the organism level, uh, which has, because that word collects a lot of things, has both unicellular and multicellular uh, differences. Uh, and um, they're both called independent organisms. And evidence for neglected levels appeared, like molecular machines, which <laughs> I just noticed in nature. In fact, this particular week, I, I noticed in nature that one of the covers uh, pictures was on molecular machines now. In, in my day, it was all cells and organelles. But now beneath organelles and different from organelles, you have molecular machines. So that actually, that new nature actually corroborates what my earlier work was 50 years ago. So we look at emergence super events and we start with the ID cycles. And of course, I went over that in the last talk, so we won't spend time on that here. But here in one slide uh, is all but the last one of those ID cycles. And they're supposed to be ID. Uh, instead of fragmentation, I uh, chose the term diversification lately. And so this is all of them. And what we're really looking at is these one part of this unbroken sequence where the emergence actually happens. And you can see that I've marked it across all of these because I think that all of those, I don't know what you call that color, light blue or something, all of those are the same across the entire cosmos. So in the meta hierarchy, that's what I called it um, back in the 1972 paper, I, I said that it was more than just a hierarchy of astronomy or a hierarchy in biology. It was a meta hierarchy because it went beyond all of them. And I de described the process by which new scalar levels uh, combine, um, which Vogt calls combogenesis and Moltz calls another word. You know, they're all coming up with these words now in the second decade of the of the 20, uh, what is it, 21st century now. Uh, but I came up with this word metacrescence from the word concrescence to describe it back in the uh, 80s. Um, concrescence is the growing together from the word concresco in uh, Latin or Italian. And metacrescence is the result where you have this entire unbroken sequence of 70 such cycles that I told you about last time. So in the lower part of the cycle, uh, which uh, you see with this arrow here, uh, you see um, a whole bunch of divergence of different things, or fragmentation, you could say, of the original integration. But it is based on this binding and body plan, you might say. And then this leads to a lot of diversity, which then has to be integrated for the next cycle, then integration diversification again. And we go over uh, about 70 such events um, connected by this emergence process of metacrescence throughout uh, the cosmos. So in the diagrams that follow, uh, as I've shown in that one, two slides back, this is the emergence event. And that's what we're trying to explain. And our hypothesis is, and it is just a conjecture and hypothesis, is that it is the same process throughout the entire universe. And this would be the theory of emergence. Uh, if there was a parallel with uh, evolution, it would be that the theory of evolution would talk about uh, the origination of a new entity or a new closed, uh, and that's only partially closed, uh, species gene pool, which leads to a speciation. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about a whole new level of emergence 
uh, an integration of the past um, uh, fragmentation that occurred. And each one of these is dependent on the last uh, in sequence. So for this talk, emergence means not the appearance of a new quality as it does to Kaufman and others. New qualities appear in aggregates anyway. This is a useful definition in some domains, but for discovery of a mechanism of emergence, it creates many irrelevant and soluble problems. So it's not the appearance of a new entity like species or a new compound. New species appear in evolution, but they're within the same hierarchical level in this definition. New structures appear in development, but this is still within the same level according to the same body plan. And so you could go through the early evolution of multicellular organisms and talk about that as being still within the level of multicellular organism. So it's appearance of a new scale of entity, and this means uh, going across a new gap uh, in, and looking at the scales of things. So all hierarchical levels are not the same. And of course, I forgot to start my timer here, <laughs> as usual. Um, and conflating them leads to confusion and miscommunication in the essence of this theory. And so I don't know if you guys can see me, but um, I distinguish between subspecialization hierarchies and emergent hierarchies. This is a new scale on my left hand here that's above, um, we're going to say, and larger in size. And once that appears, it can subspecialize. And the last one subspecialized. So when we look for levels, we sometimes confuse all of these fingers with the emergent levels. And so you have to distinguish between them. And subspecialization is post facto, it's after the level has appeared. And emergent hierarchies are ab initio. They're the beginnings before the level of occurred. And subspecialization is a top-down mechanism because the level occurs like cells occur and then organelles specialize or bodies occur and then there's changes to the organs. But emergent hierarchies we're going to see are bottom up. The gaps are less regular in the subspecialization because they depend on what is already established in the level. But the gaps are more regular, I would argue, oddly enough, in the gaps between levels or scales. And that's a huge thing that you might say. And we're just gonna look at it empirically in, in just a moment here. Gaps are lesser in magnitude in the subspecialization hierarchies because they are within the magnitude. And gaps are greater in magnitude between the scales because they're coming up with a whole new scale of reality. And we can show that in the data. If you examine the data in a different way, you can see that subspecialization hierarchies are constraint field driven, while the others are potential field driven. And humans have a very poor concept or recognition of potential fields entirely. And so subspecialization produce micro levels within the scale and emergent hierarchies produce macro levels or new scales. And so that was a very useful uh, set of distinguishing or discriminations between two types of hierarchies that aren't mentioned anywhere else in the hierarchy literature, as far as I know. And I attack the sloppy use of terms in the IEEE-S and the International Conference on Complex Systems. Uh, they keep mixing up evolution and emergence, and they muddle it with self-organization and autopoiesis. And so, Remember, evolution comes up with new entities, but just entities, differences in the body plan, for example, species, while emergence gives rise to new scales. And in evolution, there's a relative continuity, especially in microevolution, where it's variations in particular uh, gene uh, assemblies. While in emergence, there's a huge discontinuity, it seems, because of the fact that they are um, a new scale, and so they have the gap between them. Incidentally, I should elaborate on that because uh, that discontinuity does not argue against the unbroken sequence of origins um, that I'm talking about. Uh, it's, a, it's a relative thing. Um, evolution is 
completely intra-level proliferation according to this definition and emergence is inter-level proliferation because it goes to different levels. And I already talked about subspecializations and the meta hierarchy. So let's take a pause here, sort of an empirical uh, parenthetical pause and look at the empirical evidence for distinct scalar emergent levels. And Peter, uh, I don't know if you're listening to this, but that talk that Miller, uh, that interview that Miller gave uh, to me um, as he named me a founder of system science, uh, which has been ignored by everybody else, um, actually was on uh, this kind of data. So let me talk about the benefits of the data approach to systems emergence. By using their data, it attracts attention and respect of the natural sciences because it constrains modeling, like all data is supposed to do. All of scientific method and scientific experiments have really disciplined our words for using models of nature outside of ourselves. And the whole history of humans really can be taken as a, a gradual understanding that humans uh, perceive things erroneously in the beginning, a great much, much of the time, and we need uh, kind of investigations like experiments to discipline our thinking. For example, on the flat earth. I mean, all of us know that the earth is flat if we just look uh, in the distance, right? We can see a horizon, but we can't see the effects of it. It wasn't until uh, in the city-states in Italy when they were looking for incoming vessels that they began to see that the vessels gradually appeared as if they were moving across a curved surface um, when they looked into the distance. Isn't that interesting? And so the same thing goes for the sun going around the earth. It's pretty obvious if you look at it every day, you see the sun moving around the earth, right? That we rotate uh, and it's not the sun moving around the earth. It took a lot of science to figure that out. And some people still disagree with that science. So anyway, besides constraining the way we use words to describe things around us, science enables formation of more detailed models and provides feedback for model improvement, very specific things that need to be corrected. That's why we call the scientific method self-correcting, but we attack dogmas as not being self-correcting. They are eternal. Uh, not that I'm attacking religion in any way, because quite frankly, between you and me, I'm still a little seminarian. Uh, there's still a little guy inside me who looks for universals that humans should follow. It's just that we're coming up with different universals in andoranormism that are based on the isomorphies and the scientific method. So it actually brings the secular and the sacred together, which is one of my websites. Uh, I don't know if you knew about that one. Uh, it allows the basis for choice, the data, scientific experimentation data, basis for choice between alternative models and helps you form a consensus about which model is correct and uh, lets you couple models in the real natural systems. It demonstrates real contributions from system science that only system science can make. And so my hypothesis is that someday uh, the reduction of sciences are gonna actually look at system science as a source for multiple alternative hypotheses they can de then test. It's a great abductionist inspiration you might say, in Piercy, uh, C.S. Piercy's sense. Detailed models may enable more effective application. So all of this led eventually to the SP3T, the systems processes theory, which you poor students in SE5100 have been studying all semester, uh, but my participants here uh, have not really gotten anything about. And at the end of this, I even go into systems allometry, which is one of the spinoffs of SPT, uh, and adds to this theory of emergence. So let me go through what I did through the 70s and early 80s that attracted Miller's attention. Because as you know, Miller's living systems theory only refers to living and social systems. And when I visited uh, the National Science Foundation in my early youth as a young professor, I got to meet directly with an 
director of the National Science Foundation when he heard I was in town and uh, actually at NSF. How did I get such a privilege? Well, it was because uh, he and I had met uh, in the Smithsonian Institution when it sponsored a series of talks on education, uh, the advancement of education. He had subsequently become director of the National Science Foundation under something like four presidents um, and was the first one for it to uh, exceed a billion dollars in funding, as I recall. You know what he had on his desk up in the suite when I was ushered into it uh, to meet with him? Uh, he had Miller's living systems theory and uh, he really thought it was great. And I immediately used that opportunity to say, why don't you have a, a section on funding research for system science in the National Science Foundation? He says, oh, I couldn't do that. That would take too much political capital. But you can come here and start it if you'd like. Um, but I declined. I didn't think that he would last long enough or I would last long enough in that environment. Um, so things like empirical testing of hierarchy theory, since um, Miller's um, general systems theory was very based very much on hierarchical levels, as you remember, uh, not only just 20 subsystems, but also in, he started with 19, but it went to 20. Um, but uh, across, uh, oh, something like seven or eight uh, scalar levels. I tried to show that those weren't the correct scalar levels by data, and that's why he was interested. So recall I said system science needs more empirical testing. So since I was a young scientist, when I joined the IEEES, I decided to remake general systems theory so that it used data. So I asked the question, who has ever empirically proved hierarchical levels? Are they just intuitive? Are they made by humans? Well, I found uh, in that Smithsonian conversations on education, which incidentally they talk about flat panels for the first time and now we use them in all our laptops and all of our TVs at home. Uh, and at that time when they were doing it, uh, a couple of people at Stanford and other places, it was looked at into the future. It wasn't there yet. <laughs> so we were uh, ad advancing things. And the Smithsonian, it was the interdisciplinary communications program, ironically, the one that also uh, sponsored the Mexican conferences that led to Norbert Wiener writing his book uh, on cybernetics, which became the general systems theory term in in uh, Europe until Haken, Herbert Haken started uh, Synergetics, which uh, was more recent. Anyway, Al Wilson was uh, a part of those meetings when they were testing me on whether they should hire this young guy that was getting his PhD in biology, cell and molecular biology at Catholic University. Um, Wilson had developed a chart showing astronomical objects so very obey very precise uh, size limits. And this was his chart. And here's the Schwarzschild limit. And here's planets, stars, modular uh, globular star clusters, galaxies, clusters of galaxies. And you see this regular gap in between? Well, he came up with uh, on this log chart with an equation that determined the gap. And so, the astronomical hierarchy he talked about was in fact very empirical. Um, now since then, I'm not sure that we could get the same answer because you have outliers uh, that go into some of these sections here. Like if we were looking at eggs in, uh, in biological creatures, you have the ostrich egg, which is huge compared to the others. Those outliers uh, might, uh, mess up the equation. But if you took a probability distribution, you might still be able to establish that equation uh, that Wilson did. And he was a fellow of my Institute for Advanced System Studies, which you see the uh, logo for up here, uh, back uh, in those days. Um, and so were other people from Caltech. So we were saying he was proving astronomical levels, so we thought, We'll try it for biological levels. Can we see through multiparametric tests 
uh, some surprising insights into hierarchical levels. And in fact, we did and found out that the levels that Miller was using were not the ones that modeled nature, but it was pretty close. So why go empirical? It allows you to formulate better questions. And if physical and biological levels are regular and their gaps are regular, it implies we can know something about emergence between these gaps, because this is new scalar level, new scalar level. And this gap here is the place that you see discontinuity that you have to have the process of the theory of emergence go between. And further, could you see that the gaps here that were expressed in terms of gravitation, the Wilson's uh, equation, I should actually show you here, but I didn't uh, include it on these slides, actually was a measure of gravitation, which is the dominant force in these particular levels and the forming uh, by concrescence of the new level. Um, I would say that perhaps there were other dominant forces in other uh, series like, uh, you know, not the astronomical, but the biological and geological that could lead to uh, gaps there. And so this was our testing methodology. Um, uh, it, first of all, it was important to select the key parameters. And we use 15 Newtonian parameters. We collected data in biology, my students did, on mass, linear, area, density, lifetime, cycle time, development time, energy, interaction distance, interaction time, number, et cetera, to see uh, if our collection of data that was done by biologists in within their discipline according to their uh, parameter uh, measurement devices, their tools that they accepted consensually across the group. And we added five information diam uh, data information density, information transfer rate, information number, and like that. So that was our picking of 20 parameter sets. And then we used them to actually recursively try to improve our vision of the levels like Wilson had done for astronomy and the allometric relationships across the levels, which I'll go to uh, into the last section of this talk today. We're 16 minutes into the talk now. Uh, despite the fact that I didn't start it right on time. So we should be 20, 25 minutes in now. Sometimes there's a loss of parameter trails because you're using, like for instance, uh, we can't use gravity to talk about biological uh, measures. We have to use these 20 above um, and including these new informational ones that uh, you really couldn't use those, the five informational ones on the astronomical level. So there was a necessity for recursive optimization, optimization across these. And here's a sample of some of the mass values. This is 64 values. You see the normal distribution and what the uh, masses are in this case for the biomolecular level uh, and it's in kilograms. Um, so we collect the data on biopolymers from the refereed literatures, their journals. And we put them on a log plot. Why do we do a log plot? Because in allometry, you use log plots in order to see uh, some of the equations. And we looked at the means to represent this entire class. Now there were outliers, even in the case of biopolymers, much less cells. Um, and uh, the question is, should we look at the mean as the measure of central test uh, then, uh, uh, measure of central tendency, or should we look at the mode? And that's controversial and uh, could be argued by statisticians better than us. The, uh, in some ways, the mode is a better uh, meaning because outliers can affect so greatly the uh, Poisson distribution here. We see from this that uh, the Poisson distribution is good for capturing the outliers, but it also is is intra-level. It usually is in, in this case, we're just looking at the biomolecular level. Here's linear data on the cellular level. Here we have a lot more to values, 272 values, and we get the mean, and we didn't even do the 
boat in the, uh, in this particular case, but you have the min mac. And again, these are from published values. I still have these in the computer. Note again, sort of a bell-shaped curve. And so one of the articles that I published actually in uh, one of the conference proceedings that does have an ISBN number, uh, which I gave in Vienna, had this table where it showed, showed the mean of uh, values and the end number for each of the values uh, for molecules, organelles, cells, tissues, organisms, communities, and ecosystems. Incredible range of log values. And one of the first things I found as a problem is I couldn't graph them properly because none of the graphing machines would go across all of these log levels, like 10 to the minus 22 to 10 to the fifth, that's 27 different log values. Even just for biosystems, much less astronomical systems, the ranges here were across 13 orders of magnitude. And for mass, they were around 34 uh, orders of magnitude. And so that bedeviled any kind of graphing program. Now it's about 50 years later, and I bet I could find clustering graphing systems that could put the entire cosmos uh, of collected data uh, in one graph. Uh, that's another thing, the number of values. Uh, even in this little sample I did, it was 930, almost 1,000 true values from the um, literature, the bio-literature. And this is molecule, organelle, cell tissue, community organism. And this is a test for overlap of levels. And you see a couple of different things in here. It has the raw data down here. But uh, my statisticians told me that whenever you have um, the first and second standard deviation of the bell curve uh, overlapping like this here, that's not different levels, that's the same level. And so you can see here we had one, two, three, four levels, not what we thought were uh, seven levels in what we would call intuitive organization of hierarchical levels. Now, why is this important? Again, remember we're talking about a theory of emergence and we're trying to submit it to some kind of data. So we're trying to find out, well, what are the hierarchical levels that truly, uh, in terms of the data, uh, truly exist? And is it different for mass versus length versus the linear or the information values, or is it the same thing? So we went to eventually multiparametric. This one is always test for overlap using, in this case, generation time. How much time does it take to build something of the next, next level? And here again, you see four, but you uh, only uh, had data for four. So that it really doesn't test across all of them. But the four accepted levels appear to actually be four levels. And in this case, though, we had very small n numbers. And, uh, you know, this is the kind of thing you don't get biologists to do. They don't look across all these levels. Uh, if you're an ecologist, you work on the community and ecosystem level, and you're called a field biologist. An organism biologist is a botanist or a zoologist. A cell and molecular person might work in molecules and organelles, but generally speaking, they only work their entire career in one organelle. For example, they take the microtubule, or as I did, the nucleus, and concentrate on that and uh, only that. So what should I do? I, I couldn't publish this data in biological journals. In this comparison of levels and linear values, they all overlap. And so uh, there's not the six uh, accepted levels appear, perhaps only as two. So. The other thing to do is to not use one of the 20 parameters that we picked uh, alone to do the determination, but to do multiparametric tests. And we did that uh, actually to a limited degree, and that's when we got just the three levels. And this is what is discussed in that interview with Miller, as I recall. So using the multiparametric uh, tests, this is a test for whether uh, molecule, organelle, and cell are on the same uh, level. And remember, the cell has uh, organelles and molecules as subspecialization within them. 
So maybe that's why the uh, bees were grouped and the tissues were grouped and uh, the organism was uh, uh, still further from it. Um, this is using Clustan, a classic uh, program that uses four parameters at the same time in multidimensional space. Well, this is what we would like to do, is to take the 25 scales of magnitude and use normal statistics uh, in uh, a three-dimensional log uh, cube, so to speak. Um, equations are not op operable within those, but try to do automated graphing from the data directly. But automated printers were not big enough to do this sort of thing in those days when I was doing it. Uh, I could illustrate using the whiteboard, but uh, my ideal result would be a series of clouds in that three-dimensional cube space there with gaps between them that then expressed the true dimensions of the universe in data. Now, how do I apply this to emergence? Well, one of the first things, uh, we simply do not see the connecting entities between the levels we're looking at the gaps, uh, but the gaps should be considered as much real as the entities I'll show you in just a moment. It provides for the unseparated continuity between the hierarchical levels. And this is the a picture of the unbroken sequence. You see here, humans, we see these levels in nature, but what we don't see is the very unstable uh, inter uh, sets because those are in the probability space. They're not in our real space. And the emergence jump that we see is across the gap. Uh, as usual, a hierarchy is a level gap, level gap, level gap. And um, what we don't see are the unstable entities. And so we want to capture those potentials in our diagram of emergence. So putting all three of these things together, I'm in the 45th minute um, of the talk so far. Uh, one of them is this counter parity diagram that I built. Uh, and it follows what key case studies tell us about emergent levels. <clears throat> According to science accepted standards. Um, and basically, this generalized counter parity diagram I built from conceptions of chemistry because we know nucleons uh, exist in a stable area uh, on a graph like this where you have uh, counter parity on the outside and you take each nucleon and measure the alpha and the beta counter parity and you have a relatively stable uh, interior and then at some level it becomes, the nucleons become unstable and so we actually can produce um, atoms or elements which are out in this area, but they only last nanoseconds or picoseconds. And so we don't see them in nature very much and they can't contribute to compounds. And uh, I've proposed calling this the wilson Trincali limit. I have to tell you, Wilson didn't like that I used his name here and said, well, at least I have control of my name, I think. Um, but frankly, it came from seeing the gaps in his astronomical data and the equations that he had for the gaps that define them. Uh, so I'm thinking that you have a wilson Trincali limit at which the complexity for this body plan, uh, this counter parity becomes unstable. And all of these are unstable here too, because they don't have the balance between the counter parity. And so there's this narrow band of stable entities, and that's what we see as the level of the hierarchy. There's a largest scalar size for that cohort of natural entities, and the natural scalar hierarchies arise from these natural dualities. So that's a big, uh, a big hypothesis there. But this is true then of all natural systems uh, uh, and those that are defined. Is it refutable? Yeah, because we can disprove any of these uh, things that we say here. So the process for the emergence of new levels uh, is different from the evolutionary process because that is just on the level of, of basically uh, new species. 
and just looking at the evolutionary process, and I taught it for 40 or 50 years, uh, though that doesn't mean you should agree with me, but it, it usually breaks down to five simple steps. All natural populations generate random variation. They really show different traits from the genetics, and we can describe how the genetics creates those variations. Incidentally, this stopped Darwin for 30 or so years from publishing his theory of evolution because he didn't understand genetics, and that was before genetics. Um, and uh, he couldn't figure out how that variation was happening in the population. But that population over reproduces, and actually a preacher named Malthus uh, came up with that. He showed for the human population, we tend to over reproduce. And that leads to selection by the environment. There's too little resources, so there has to be a die off. Now, that impetus for the die off uh, could be random, but it turns out to be non random because of the variation that you had in the first step. So, since there's variance in the population, you get differential reproduction. You have different longevity, creatures lasting long enough, or fecundity, having more babies. And so you get uh, uh, basically more survival in those that are better adapted. And that then leads to adaptation and speciation or the isolation of the gene pool. Now, of course, nowadays we know that gene pools aren't totally isolated. We know that bacteria that of different species actually exchange genes laterally, and they call it horizontal transfer. But the question is, what is the most likely thing? And that's not horizontal transfer. So we're going to show different steps for the theory of emergence process, but it should be a process like that. Remember, we're looking at empirically defined levels. This is my drawing of the Wilson picture. And in this particular paper, I actually gave his equation, and I just don't have it here, I'm sorry. But in this particular case, remember, uh, gravity was dominant. What happens for the other ones? So how can we take the astronomical levels that Wilson uh, proved after he graduated from Caltech uh, to new levels of magnitude that are predictable? Um, and the gaps should be predictable and have uh, a basic similarity because of this diagram, the counter parity diagram. So basically, it's really uh, the counter parity diagram that has arisen um, basically from studies of uh, the periodic table. Now, remember I told you that uh, most intra-level, that's within the new emergent level, uh, objects have variation imposed, not by reproductive uh, genetic mutations and, and sexual recombination, but in fact, uh, they just have probabilistic uh, normal distributions. Uh, this is not Zipf's law, uh, because that uh, leads to a long tail distribution in the power laws. And that, I think, is between levels uh, of complexity, not within a level. So within a level, you get what is called a normal distribution. And this shows the normal uh, distribution within a level. They're all built on the same corporate plan or architecture, if you will. I mean, I had to use some kind of word here, but it's based on that fundamental counter parity, which gives rise to that level. Um, according to this, I'm about 50 minutes, and I'm getting close to the end of the theory of emergence. But, okay, so we're within a level here, okay? And incidentally, I don't know if you've ever played this game, but you can do this yourself. If you make a series of random, or oh, uh, in fact, you can use uh, um, Leibniz's, uh, not Leibniz's, uh, uh, series of pins and you drop balls down them, uh, because of the probability, I mean, you could use this in a, uh, in a uh, what do you call that, those games at the, at the seashore when you pull back the ball and the ball goes, out there, uh, it usually bounces around and bounces around. And if you collect the balls, they'll form a normal distribution like that. So natural systems will form this kind of distribution. But if they do that, it means that there's always extremes, extremes. 
and that's why I have them circled here. The extremes are opposites uh, in some uh, configuration. Uh, they often have too much of something or too little of something. And the fact is, is that when there's a large population, you're going to have a large population of the extremes, and the extremes are going to attract each other. That's what I call counter parity. Um, let's go back to it. Um, it's parity because it's on the same level. It's counter because it's opposites, because it's opposites of the bell-shaped curve. So if this normal distribution often happens, you're going to get counter parities. Um, but that leads to entity stability and instability. How do things bond? I hope that Tom Marzoff is listening at this point. Uh, he didn't join us in the beginning, but he loves binding and basically combogenesis. That's why he's meeting with uh, Mobus, uh, Volker, uh, Solito group. Well, there's a central stability. Oh, and I didn't. Uh, include my subsumption diagram. I should have it after this one. Central stability is the long-term existence of the entity on the new emergent level. It really is the result of a whole series of subsumed materials. Um, your body has quarks in it, but the quarks don't affect your interaction with your wife, hopefully not your quarks anyway. Um, or your hadrons, or your uh, baryons, or your electrons, or all the subsumed things, even your cells, uh, unless they're uh, not metabolizing properly, um, don't affect your interaction with your eye. Your interactions uh, are not at the central stability level, which is a whole series of subsumed lower levels, and that's where I should have that diagram. And I developed some diagrams for subsumption, which are pretty good in my integrated science work for natural science foundations. But at the same time, for many of these entities, the bell-shaped curve part, uh, the inner parts, are actually the central stability. That, that I didn't bring out before. And the outer parts are relatively unstable because they're these counterparities. Uh, it's proportionally the smaller part for a uh, active entity that can give rise, a stable entity that can give rise to the next level. If it's if it's this red area is too big, then in fact it becomes an unstable entity, and it's in the gap, not or the potential gap, not the uh, uh, arisal of a new level. So an example would be elements joining into compounds. It's the electron what do you call it, shells that uh, complement each other to make a more complete shell uh, that cause the compounds to interact in the proportions that they do. So on the next chart, see 40 putative dualities uh, from the literature that could be serving as counter parodies. Uh, I think I don't have that table here, but I had it in one of my papers. Remember, Counter parity means the opposite nature of the forces or structures or variants so that they complement each other and are forced into joining with each other, just like the electron shells being empty or uh, full uh, with extra ones, such that you can get uh, compounds from uh, different elements. Parity because they are the electron shells and so they're the same magnitude. So you get these. Uh, dualities and I'm supposed to have <laughs> this chart and I didn't put it in here I'm sorry about that but it doesn't matter because all of those dualities uh, are not what we would call emergent counter parodies anyway those still have to be discovered uh, discovered so this is a new neologism that I created, like uh, concrescence and metacrescence, uh, to deal with uh, uh, the theory of emergence, uh, to not get stuck on the dualities that I was going to show in that chart. Because the counter parity gives rise to the uh, next level. And this is step two uh, from the uh, bell-shaped uh, chart. Uh, and this is actually uh, neutron number and proton number balanced in 
nucleons, and these are the nucleons that are stable, then it goes into fission type nucleons, and then it gets to these unstable ones. So this is a real example of uh, proton unstable and neutron unstable nuclei on the outside. So this is a counterparity diagram uh, as a real case study in nature. And this describes all of the periodic table in essence and our experiments even nowadays uh, beyond the periodic table into unstable compounds. Isn't that incredible? Um, and now there are other ones, like there's a maximum and minimum stability for a given number of species in a community uh, for the community level. And um, from these, I get the generic counterparity diagram. But you see that I don't have anything in the table of counterparities. And this is the crux of the theory of emergence for proving it uh, besides hypothesizing it on the theoretical level. Unless I can find counterparities as good as the ones on the um, atomic level for elements uh, getting together into compounds, that is the electron shells. Well, I could say electron shells and I could say a positive and negative uh, Van der Waals forces in in protein complexes and the lock key shape. Those are clearly counter parities, which I could have added to this table, but I don't have. Unless we can show them for all of the 70 levels in the unbroken sequence of origins, you could falsify this uh, particular theory of emergence. So identifying features in counter parity for defining it is dual morphology or dual force, mirror image opposites, which creates a complementary binding because they neutralize similar orders of magnitude because they're on the same architecture, similar stable lifetimes, binding energies and distances. And so they're essentially equal uh, because they're on the same level of hierarchy. That's why they, uh, they can give rise to a new level when the bell-shaped curve creates a new counter parity. Um, when alone, the counterparty creates a uh, potential space, but when bound to its partner, the unit complex is neutralized. And so from this, I came up with another neologism, the neutrality quest. Nature keeps uh, trying to form neutralities by complementing and satisfying the counterparities uh, over and over again at new uh, levels of scale and new parts. And so you can get from this the satisfied counter parity and the unsatisfied counter parities, which are other neologisms which I associate with this. And then the concrescence ratio, con is Latin for with and cresco crescare is to grow with, to grow together in essence. The concrescence ratio is the ratio between the central stability and its entity and its peripheral instability. Too much and you get an unstable entity and that's in outside of that uh, middle uh, region where you get the stable entities. And too little and it just doesn't bind with anything. And so it can be uh, unreactive and so uh, doesn't lead to a new level of scalar level. So the role of neutrality question, you've heard nature abhors a vacuum. Nature also abhors an unconquered complemented counter parity. So the inbuilt potential for a combination of any uncomplemented CP at any skater levels of any type seeks to become complemented. And so we call it the neutrality quest. And with that, we get the unbroken sequence of origins of new systems. So this drives the entire ID unbroken sequence. As I showed you before, in every place, this is the same process. Um, meditation on paradox and love. Why in the hell did I throw that on? Well, I've got to tell you that systems processes theory loves paradox because paradoxes are within a level. And in order to solve a paradox, you should go to other levels. And the concept of love is that uh, combinations are absolutely necessary to meet neutrality. So, you know, it's sex across the cosmos, I guess you could say. And, and the entire cosmos of entities is seeking neutrality, 
the fulfillment of all potential bindings, and each is subject to the push to complete its potential for binding. Uh, and thus the, the push to neutrality becomes or becomes the metacresence or the dynamics that leads to many hierarchical levels. And uh, again, it's important to realize the, uh, the connecting uh, result of seeing the potential objects and not just seeing the uh, un, uh, unsatisfied potential. So the neutrality quest results in a progression of ever higher levels, that should be ever higher levels, that is scales of satisfied counterparity. The net result is overall cosmic emergence or new equilibria that transgress past equilibria, past skater levels. And so that's why I say that nature keeps throwing off these um, new systems at new levels all the time. So step one is diversification of entities on a newly emerged level. That's that fragmentation or div uh, diversification part. Step two is the appearance of a new counterparity at the extreme ends of the normal distribution within that new thing um, that has all those variants. And then diverse entities seek neutrality for the counterparity, uh, and so they combine, and that creates an entirely new uh, symmetry, a, an entirely new level, and it leads to a symmetry break, which is big in physics, but doesn't fit anywhere else in the theories of other things, and that results in a new scalar level of aggregates that appear on the log charts. Okay. And remember, we don't see the connecting entities in between because they're unstable, according to this. So where is the selection? Neutrality quest and the demands of central stability drive the selection. They restrict the alternatives. So there is selection also in the emergent fields. What creates chaos between the levels? Well, we can't see what happens in the uh, those things which are unstable. The limits of central stability and concrescence ratio are all we can see. Uh, so there's a diversity in the potential field um, and uh, we just don't see it. And remember the importance of symmetry breaks and new aggregates or new binding. Okay, so the resulting levels exhibit consistent patterns and key parameters across all the levels. And in this I'm getting to the new field which uh, also comes from systems processes theory. There's about a dozen of them, which is called systems allometry, which uh, relates to bioallometry. Now, if, if you look at bioallometry, there's many, many relationships between everything, skeleton mass, home range, body surface, body length, population density, I mean, all kinds of things. Heat transfer per gram, uh, hearing, stepping frequency, heart rate, uh, and the mass of an individual. And this has been shown extensively for bioallometry. But bioallometry is often shown as data that's very good in search of a theory. According to my watch, we're at an hour and six minutes, but I'm getting, this is the last section. So we collected these Newtonian and information parameters in the way that I showed you and looked at these very large data sets to try to see on the systems level, not just the bio level, are there allometries that can be expressed in log terms? And this is an important one right here. And I, it's the mass versus linear. And it looks at planets, stars, uh, clusters of stars, and clusters of galaxies. And look at the probability here is less than 0 0.001. Uh, if you take the means of mass dimension and the means of linear dimension, it shows they're allometrically related. And here we go into biology too. Uh, in addition, uh, in the biology, it's 0 0.00017. Uh, it actually comes up with this uh, line, this log line here between logs of means of linear dimensions and mass for all the biological things. And it comes up with the allometric equation y equals 0 0.0017 to the x squared. And We've shown this for a number of different things. In this particular case, we've mixed lifespan data and mass dimensions uh, across 
I think it's clusters of galaxies, galaxies, there's astronomical and biological things in here, and it goes down all the way to the molecular, and you get y equals 0 0.031 to the square of x. And so you get these allometric equations. I count these um, as systems parameters, and it shows that it's shows in another way why I say that nature is spinning off the same system over and over again. It's not just the isomorphies that show similarities, but it's the data of the real things in the levels of organization that show these similarities. Here's a regression of mass versus linear dimension for biohierarchical levels, molecules to ecosystems. Now some of you might complain that tissues and organs are so far away from this line, but in fact, it shows rather nicely a log line there. And this is lifespan values, molecules to ecosystems. And again, it shows um, a similarity. And this is interaction distance across biohierarchical levels. You get the idea? Uh, and this one is developmental time versus interaction distance uh, for those levels that we had. So the design of a new system is not totally independent of its emergent level, and in fact, the data is related. That is incredible. Uh, and then if you put these in a third order polynomial, of course, uh, the criticism of this is that if you put things in a multi-parameter polynomial, you can match any data to it. But in this one with the probability 0 0.001, less than 0 0.001, that means 97% of the data is explained. You get a correlation of mass, I wish I, I could see this, versus linear dimensions in atomic, biological, and astronomical hierarchical levels. And in here you get an allometric equation, uh, including all of those things. Uh, that's incredible. This has never been reported before uh, any place else. So you get this new field of systems allometry from these kind of data. And it follows naturally that the unbroken sequence of systems origin is because of the action of systems field axioms. And this is the original diagram I made in, of the meta hierarchy of origins in the 1972 paper, my first paper for IEEE, which did win the, the, West, the Far West uh, Regional Meetings best paper for the year. but. <laughs> Now there's not even a far west region of IEEE. Um, and it shows the beginning of what I was thinking of for systems processes theory, as well as for the meta hierarchy. And I think it's the action of the systems field axioms that caused this and um, the general systems life cycle, which I can't get into right now. So let's see where we are. Oh, at the end here, what I was going to go through, I already went through in systems education too, that I taught a course on this at UC San Diego in 86 that had Nobel Prize laureates and others in it. I went through that already. Um, and so, and then in my own course, I taught uh, uh, talked about this all through the 70s and 80s and 90s and 2000s until I retired. Um, and so in terms of cron charts, the later people like uh, Vision and Chasen and Christian and Kaufman who are talking about emergence really should talk about concrescence instead of combogenesis because it was preceded by this work a long time ago. Uh, but they're not doing that. They're not referring to it. And uh, that is basically the end of the slides. Uh, there are some things that they're adding which I think are important, uh, but they should add it to and cite uh, the work that's gone on before. Uh, and um, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Okay, I'm done today, Peter. Um,